and we're live. Good afternoon. Um, thanks so much to those of you out there who have joined us today. Uh, this is the third now, I think, in a series of Hangouts on current policy issues. Um, as many of you have been following us for a while, and those of you who are new to us know, we started Google Take Action to inform and engage internet users on public policy issues that affect the internet. Um, we've re relied a lot on written communication in the past, um, but in order to have a conversation, we think it's really one of the best ways to help people learn. So today, we've invited two experts from civil society to talk about some exciting developments in the California legislature regarding uh, surveillance reform. Uh, so we have Gautam Hans from the Center for Democracy and Technology and Chris Conley of the ACLU of Northern California. Before we dive in, I'll let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their organizations. Um, Gautam, you first. Hi, everyone. Gautam Hans. I'm a policy counsel at the Center for Democracy and Technology, based here in San Francisco. Uh, I work on a range of technology policy issues from consumer privacy to law enforcement access to free expression, and have uh, worked on this effort for about a year now. CDT at the federal level is also working on similar legislation in Congress, and we're happy to be both pursuing this at the federal level and in the state of California which has led the way on so many technology policy issues over the last few decades. Great. Hi. And my name is Chris Conley. I'm an attorney and reform computer scientist with the ACLU of Northern California. Uh, the ACLU is the American Civil Liberties Union. We are the largest and oldest civil liberties and civil rights organization in the U.S. We have over half a million members in all 50 states and every U.S. territory. Uh, my role in California, much like Autumn's, is to work on the intersection of privacy, free speech, and new technology, to work on legislation and in the courts and with companies and individuals on ways to embrace and promote and expand the rights of individuals to protect their personal information in the digital age and speak freely. Awesome. Um, so I have a list of questions uh, we're ready to ask, and I know there are some places we want to start. But if you happen to be watching the live stream, I enabled the Q&A app, so you can submit some questions there as well. Um, I've also uh, picked up some of the questions that were already posted on the G Plus page, and I'll try to take a look at that um, as we go along as well. But if you, if you can use the Q&A app, that's probably easier, so I don't risk crashing my computer. Um, so we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Um, but I'd like to start first by asking you both um, to kind of Talk a bit about, uh, you know, give some background on CalAct Plus so we have a, a good place to start from here. Um, and so, Chris, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, what protections will CalAct Plus provide that currently don't exist in law? So one of the main reasons for pushing CalAct Plus is the fact that electronic privacy law in the United States is woefully outdated. I mean, we're having a chat on our computers and our cell phones using our web cameras on, on the web, on the internet today. Um, the federal privacy law, it's called the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, was written in 1986. It predates not only Google+, Plus, not only chats, not only Google the company, it predates the World Wide Web. And so we are working with law that simply does not match the technology we have today. And unfortunately, the federal government has not really addressed this by meaningfully updating ECPA in the almost 30 years since its enactment. So the goal of California's Electronic Communication Privacy Act, CalECPA, is to actually impose real meaningful privacy protections in California to ensure that digital information receives the same kind of protection that physical information would receive. Under the U.S. Constitution, law enforcement would need a warrant to search your house. If they want to find a letter in a shoebox, if they want to find what's on your personal computer hard drive, they would need a warrant. Unfortunately, it's not as clear if that same protection applies to your content in the cloud. Um, Likewise, law enforcement is, you know, there are instances where law enforcement is tracking location, is accessing information about your communication, all sorts of metadata. Um, we know the NSA is doing that, and we'll talk more about that. And we believe that this information should be protected with strong legal protections that are consistent across the board. Uh, one of the other problems here is that because the law is so outdated, there are so many loopholes and gray areas in existing law. There are real questions about what kind of legal process is allowed, what companies can cannot are required to do if they get a certain kind of legal process for the contents of an email or for location information or whatever it may be. Um, and we would like to have a clean and consistent rule across the board so that everyone knows exactly what the playing field is and so that all electronic information has strong protection 
that we believe it should exist under the California and U.S. constitutions, but isn't always being applied properly. Thanks, Chris. Um, so an, another quick question is sort of how, given that the given that ECPA is um, is not quite as far along as Cal ECPA would be, how does how does that sort of impact Californians? How how do the two two laws interact? Um, so the the goal of Cal ECPA would be to to embrace and enhance the protections of federal law. So there there's no tension between the two. Uh, federal law actually one of the nice things about the existing law is it explicitly allows states to provide additional protections so that they're not bound they're not required to comply with you know if even if federal law allows access under certain circumstances or there are gray areas in federal law states can present a higher standard can provide more protection for their individuals and calacpa is designed to provide that standard for californians and you know, we all know that the many of the cal technical companies and many of our engineers and many of our active users of the internet are in California, and we want to make sure that Californians have, not, not because they're Californians, but because that's where I happen to work, have the strongest protection possible. Um, and then Gautam, uh, you know, what would the passage of the Cal ECPA mean for the rest of the country, even though it's a California-specific law? Yeah, absolutely. So California, as Chris mentioned, has so many users, it's the most populous state in the nation, and so many early adopters of technology are here in California, as well as many of the major companies. And in terms of technology law, we've seen that where California has acted, other states and sometimes even the federal government have also followed. A really good example of this is uh, surrounding data breach notification. California, I believe, was the first state or one of the first states to enact a data breach notification law, which now has spread to I think 47 or so states, that's almost every state in the country. And we've seen this in other areas as well, not just in technology, in air quality, consumer protection, environmental law, uh, a whole range of statutes that California passes not only affect this state, but also really can be a bellwether for other states and for the federal government. And we really hope that the strong protections that Cal ECPA would provide would be taken up by other states that would view this law as really modern and really necessary for their individual citizens in an age where we're collecting and transmitting data on a near constant basis. Thank you. Um, are there any other states who currently have similar laws that you know of? There are a handful of states that have passed laws protecting particular kinds of electronic information, specifically the contents of electronic communications, so the contents of your emails, or your text messages, and location information. But the goal of CalECPA is, is essentially to go much broader than that, to make sure that there's consistent protection for all forms of electronic communication. Because we know with the advent of newer technologies that ways of aggregating information and, and finding needles in haystacks are growing, are growing increasingly powerful. And so we want to make sure that the people whom, with whom you communicate, the people you call or the people you email or text, that information is protected. Information about your location, again, some states are protecting it. We want to make sure that's protected. The goal of CalECPA is to kind of wrap many forms of electronic communication rather than picking and choosing what gets protection and what does not. And in particular, recognizing that as new technology comes along, we'll have new forms of information online, information about our health, information about our all sorts of other activities that we want to, we want to have the same strong protections that we apply to, you know, all the communication contents and others in other states. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump to uh, a, a specific question that Steve B.H. posted on the event page uh, earlier this week. Um, the SB 178 looks nice, but will it have any effect? Does SB 178 prohibit state cops from even possessing info after the feds hand it over, and how can it? So obviously one of the real tensions here and one of the challenges in passing a law in the states is that we, we are required to comply with federal law. So where federal law mandates something to happen, state law cannot prohibit it. But what we see in, in the, the rally on the ground is that in many cases, local law enforcement are using these authorities. They're not cooperating with the feds. They're not cooperating with even the local state authorities. They're acting on their own auspices to, to demand or request vast amounts of information for individuals. So I think that the impact of, Cal of a state law, while it cannot necessarily prescribe all sorts of interaction between the federal and state governments, on the local and state level is still very dramatic because that's where you are seeing sheriffs, you are seeing local cops, you are seeing all sorts of 
individuals who are exceeding what the authority they should have and collecting vast amounts of information or searching devices without proper legal process. The other piece of this is, is that beyond merely requiring a warrant for information, it also would prevent any information that was collected in violation of the statute from being introduced at trial, which we you know, refer to as a suppression remedy. This means that it doesn't just mean that you have a right to demand a warrant before law enforcement access your data. It means that if they don't respect that right, if they fail to get a warrant, whatever information they collect can't be introduced at trial. So this is not merely a right, there's also a remedy as well for people who find that the government hasn't followed the law. Great. Um, so I think it's useful uh, to talk really briefly about um, kind of where the law stands right now in terms of progress through the, uh, the, the path through the legislature. Sure, so the, the, um, the bill was passed by the Senate by in, I believe it was June, uh, on a 39 to zero vote. So it, it, there were one abstention because someone was uh, unavailable to be on the floor, so we cannot claim a unanimous vote, but there were no votes against the bill in the, in the Senate. Um, it is currently going to go to the assembly floor for a vote. It is passed out of its last assembly committee and we'll be seeing a floor vote in the assembly within the next week or so. And after that, assuming it passes that, um, it will head to the governor's office and await his signature. So what, what, uh, we have two related questions. Uh, one of them is from Jay, uh, Jay Necht, and his question is, what is the best thing that we can do to get these protections passed? Um, and then we also had a question on the G Plus event page from Peter Osnett. Uh, can you just send us a petition to sign? Uh, why do this now? Um, and so you know, for people who want to get involved uh, at this point and possibly in the future, what, what, what can they do to get involved and, and help make sure that Cal suit gets passed. So I believe that there's the take action campaigns that both Google and, and ACLU and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF, have hosted in order to encourage individuals to take action by contacting their assembly person within the state of California. Um, as well, once we uh, hopefully pass through the assembly, we'll be going to the governor's desk um, and there will also be opportunities then for citizen activism to ensure that the governor's office knows that this is an important bill for California citizens um, to feel comfortable and confident that their data is being protected. Right. And that actually leads to another related question uh, from Lauren Weinstein. Uh, given that Governor Brown has vetoed legislation to prohibit police in California from conducting warrantless searches of cell phones of people under arrest, how realistic do you believe it is to expect the governor to not block this new legislative effort? So I, I think there are a number of things that have changed that, that really reflect a different climate and will hopefully, <coughs> excuse me, hopefully convince our governor to sign this bill. Um, one of the major changes, of course, are the revelations by Edward Snowden about wide-scale surveillance by the U.S. government. And that has really changed the tenor of the conversation about the appropriate role and the need for limits and procedural protections and safeguards on government access to and use of information. So that, that has actually changed the climate considerably. Um, one of the consequences of that has been that companies have been much more engaged in the conversation, recognizing that they need to build trust from their users, and part of doing so means ensuring their users that they're, they're fighting the good fight as well, that they are trying to limit government authority. And so unlike the previous bills, this bill is supported by a broad coalition of companies, Google, Facebook, um, Twitter, Apple, many other companies are officially supporting this bill and are urging the governor to sign this. Um, and then one final piece that is very different in this situation is that we have been engaging with law enforcement throughout the process of, of, the, of having the bill go through the Senate and now the Assembly. And at this point, none of the major California law enforcement agencies are opposing the bill. They are all satisfied by the amendments that have been taken, by the tone of the bill, that it adequately allows them to do their job to protect public safety while protecting personal privacy. They don't see this as something that is detrimental to their organization. And that, that obviously is a significant change from previous bills and hopefully is enough to convince the governor that this is the time for us to enact robust privacy for electronic communications. One piece of that as well is that, as you mentioned, there are other states that have taken up this uh, issue and are starting to pass laws. And while we certainly support any laws that protect uh, individuals from government access without warrants, we also know that because of California's importance and because of how many entities that collect data that are received 
these data requests from the government are based here, it's important that California act now before too many other states start to create conflicting or inconsistent laws that would create a lot of uncertainty both for individuals and for you know providers that have to worry about different standards. We think it's important that a strong standard in California sends a clear message, and we hope that you know the governor recognizes that as well. We don't want to be late to this party and find that the law ends up being really confusing for individuals. Great. Um, and I'm going to take one more question from the Q&A app here. Um, and it's kind of uh, going back to the sort of what Cal ECPA would, it, would accomplish. Um, how does Cal ECPA affect the data that's on my cell phone? So, so we've talked a little bit about Cal ECPA and, and its provisions protecting information held by service providers, by the, the Google and, and in the cloud. But it also has provisions that require a warrant under ordinary circumstances to obtain information from a device like a cell phone. Uh, there was a Supreme Court case last year that held that a warrant was required to physically search a phone, and Cal ECPA makes sure that that same protection would apply even to remote access to a phone, to trying to access it through some you know, remote electronic communication. So it would, in general, with, with certain appropriate exceptions for emergencies and such, require a warrant to access the information on your cell phone. Great. Um, is there anything else that you guys think is kind of, I mean, if there was one really important thing for you to make sure that everybody watching now or later would know about this particular law, what kind of, what would that be? Can you even boil it down into a simple nugget? So I think, I mean, I think the important thing to know is that we, we really, we're looking at the goal of Calicpa is to have a bill that reflects both the present and the future of technology that is not bounded by the, the conception of how the internet worked 30 years ago when email was something you downloaded to your computer and therefore if you left it on a server for more than 180 days it was fair game because it was like abandoned property. That's just not the world we live in today and we need a law, we need laws in every state and in the federal, in the federal level as well that reflect the fact that we use technology in a radically different way and we hope that CalAQPA is a step not only to protecting privacy for Californians but as a model for other states and, and the federal government as well. I really want to emphasize the sort of timeliness of this bill, both within our current political process here in California and as Chris mentioned, in terms of how technology is used today. And I think it's really important to ensure that, you know, California citizens do take action, do contact their assembly person and hopefully the governor's office when it passes through the legislature to ensure that this is something that we have clear evidence um, it's a priority for individuals because I think for all of us who use technology and that's a, a, you know, an increasing portion of the population, this is a really uh, crucial bill at a crucial time and we hope that we can get strong public support. Great. Uh, well, I want to thank you both so much for joining me um, and uh, thanks to everyone who watched as well. Um, in terms of the links to be able to take action, um, I will share all of those on the, uh, the Google Take Action Google Plus page, um, and I'll post them. I'll, I'll, I'll post some of them to the uh, the event as well. But um, we are now officially on Google Plus as uh, plus.google.com plus Google Take Action. Um, so you can follow us there, and we'll share updates on CalEXPA's progress, um, as well as all of the relevant links to help you take action. Um, and of course, uh, you can spread the word uh, by visiting google.com slash take action. Um, so thank you so much, and take care. Thanks for having us. Bye.